the golden age of the rigid airship has long generated romantic notions of second chances and alternative outcomes. Had the R-101 left the mast just a half hour later and avoided the worst of the storm in France, R-101 survival would have meant lessons learned from Canadian and Indian operations could be applied to the R-102 and later airships. If the USS Akron had received the full weather map and easily sailed around the storm, Rear Admiral Moffat's survival would have encouraged Akron's continued refinement. If USS Macon had completed her upper fin strengthening before the last war game, Macon would have deployed to Pearl Harbor and practiced multiple airplane scouting with the Pacific Fleet. And most infamously, what if Captain Pruce had simply refused the Americans' high landing? So Hindenburg could have made an ordinary on-the-wheel touchdown on May 6, 1937. Even after losing Akron and Macon, Congress might have constructed the Bureau of Aeronautics' 9.5 million cubic foot ZRCV. Had they paid attention to the Durand Committee reports, the greatest aeronautical minds of the day having concluded the rigid airship was worthy of further development. In final form, nine Northrop XBT-1 dive bombers would have been carried externally. No need to house the large airplanes up within the hull. Goodyear Aircraft had perfected a new rigid design, carrying both fighters and bombers. Goodyear had built test sections, one of which survives in Akron today. The German assembly sheds had been lengthened. Their 100-passenger Zeppelin of more than 9 million cubic feet had been started in 1938. Even after the accident, once they discovered how the Hindenburg's fabric ignited, the Germans inflated the new Graf Zeppelin with hydrogen and started flying spy missions, even sampling British radar. The U.S. Congress actually funded the ZRN, a three-airplane training rigid airship. Roosevelt ruled that any new rigid could not exceed 350 feet in length, favoring the metal clad. Navy men refused, and the funding expired. While the last flying rigid airship was propped up on sticks and suspended from its hangar just a few days before World War II began, when the Nazi invasion faltered in Norway, some officers prepared to use the Graf as a mission-saving cargo carrier. But Reichsmarschall Ermann Göring had already ordered its destruction. When America entered the war, Fleet Admiral King made an attempt to reinstate the flying carrier, much cheaper than a flat top and invulnerable to torpedoes and mines. In his historical fiction novel, ZRS, Author Rowan Partridge creates a world in which the last four infamous airship accidents had not happened, and rigid airship design was still evolving internationally in 1938. One must remember that the era of the rigid airship came and went, before the perfection of such everyday technologies as the blind rivet, spot-weldable aluminum, and reversing props. George Scott's survival might have allowed such developments as R-101's enlarged D configuration and its drafting into war service in 1939. Competitive pressure from England's empire of the air and the need for hard currency would have inspired the Germans to expand their passenger service even before 1934. The Americans, condemned to believe their own helium propaganda, would have had to build a 12 million cubic foot airship in order to regain dominance in rigid airships. Since we know the actual technology, we can make educated speculation as to the design of the novel's USS Long Island. For screenplay purposes, we will assume the Navy continued to successfully fight off Roosevelt's favoring the metal clad. Therefore, the first parameter we have to determine deals with the finest ratio. That's the relationship of length to diameter. Examples range from the football-shaped ZMC-2 through the torpedo-like L-59, the Akron and Macon, 
Hindenburg and Graf Zeppelin II, and ZRCV had fineness ratios within a tenth of a point of each other. Splitting the difference, we decided on a ratio of six. Next, Mr. Norman Mayer developed a formula for determining airship parameters. For Norm's formula, we find the Akron, Macon, Hindenburg, and Graf Zeppelin II had the same gas-to-air volume value of 0 0.92. With the finest ratio of 6, our Long Island's total hull volume is 13,643,478 cubic feet. The USS Long Island has a length of 962 feet. Her largest diameter will be 163 feet. That is an easy fit in Akron's air dock. But Long Island would fit in Moffett Field's hangar number one, owing to the square cube law. You can see a World War II blimp and a post-war blimp twice its volume is not twice as wide or twice as tall. The Akron and Macon used 12 main bays to house their 12 gas cells. Hindenburg and Graf used 16. More cells pay for their weight with redundancy safety. Our Long Island will also use 16 bays and gas cells. Dura aluminum sheet was stamped and punched for riveting into structural members. Zeppelin and Goodyear Zeppelin each had their preferred designs of beams. Gusset plates and doublers were used to join girder sections, maintaining good electrical bonding. Zepp and Goodyear Zepp built specialized riveting tools. Zeppelins used T-joint wire-braced main rings. Akron and Macon used triangular built-up main rings. Long Island will also use these damage-resistant deep main rings. Rings were floor assembled, then hoisted, with intermediate rings attached. Shored up from below and suspended from the hangar, the fragile structure was also tied off to the building's sides. Attaching the rings to each other offered designers many options. R100's rings were assembled using complex pre-made spider joints, ready to attach the longitudinal girders. Some sort of backbone, or keel, spread the pinpoint loads across the flyweight gas bags. These included petroleum fuel tanks, ballast sacks, and cargo holds. R101 avoided the standard keel, also using triangular deep main rings, which carried some heavy loads. The Akron and Macon's upper keel walkway allowed complete access to gas valves and upper stations. Long Island will retain this crucial upper keel. R100 traded some gas capacities for a three-story passenger interior. Akron and Macon's airplane truss was also intrusive. But airplanes need not be brought inside. Since the design had not started out as airplane carriers, Akron's added airplane truss was dead weight. The Long Island will instead double the Hindenburg spine-like keel to carry the concentrated loads of fuel, ballast, and airplanes. Jeffrey Cook's intense study of airship empennage set the LTA world abuzz when he found Carl Arnstein's lack of Zeppelin-like cruciform beams in Akron-Macon was not their major fin problem. The Long Island will use strength members in the right place for the aerodynamic loads. Each of the great rigids featured different motive power. R100's tandem engine cars also contained generators. R101's power cars contained both Canadian Railroad locomotive diesel engines and their gasoline starting motors. Akron Macon's inboard engine rooms were fireproofed, but were criticized as creating more problems than they solved. All Zeppelins, including Hindenburg, were pushers, while the second Graf Zeppelin adopted tractor cars for several reasons. Recovering exhaust water weight was very useful, even when flying under hydrogen. Long Island's tractor-style cars are to contain packards, built as right or left-handed rotation. Evolution of the bridge enclosures moved toward larger, more complex control cars. Long Island will use the double-decker car design idea by C.P. Burgess. The Pryfly is on the lower deck 
so the Airbus has a commanding view of the flight line. A retractable boarding ladder adjusts to wheel or mast mooring. Early airships' freezing Spartan cruise quarters contrasted R101's luxury passenger spaces. Akron Macon set our standard with heated crew quarters, mess, and sanitary heads. This 1942 magazine foresaw tractor-style power cars on a larger airship. But was there really enough room to bring a 40-foot wingspan airplane inside the hull? ZRCV was eventually upgraded to carry Northrop dive bombers outside the hull. The Akron and Macon Sparrowhawks and the XBT-1 were both flying in 1935. XBT-2 became the SBD when Donald Douglas left Northrop Aircraft. A lightweight ZSBD becomes our airship's attack plane. However, a small fighter scout airplane concept preceded the bomber. Bureau of Aeronautics Design 124 was quite advanced for its day. Our model of it flew quite well. The airplane will play the role of the novel's P-77 fighter. The novel suggests the USN had it both ways, fighter and attack planes. How would they be handled? Long Island would have nine airplane bays. Each of the center nine bay bottoms are equipped with flip-up and roll-up doors for the airplanes. A swing-down airplane trapeze would be mounted on each of the nine reinforced main frames. Flip-up and roll-up doors would allow fighter deployment and recovery with the trapeze. In Bay 6 through 11, an I-beam trolley receives the fighter's weight off the trapeze onto a trolley. And the airplane is then boat-hooked outboard for stowage, just as was done on Akron and Macon. ZSBDs are recovered and launched with the trapeze, but not completely enclosed in the hull. ZSBD upper fuselage and canopy is accessible by climbing the support structure in between the fighter airplanes. Their weight recovered in flight and carried dynamically, planes are stowed for transit to the combat theater. The Long Island will exist in digital form, with full-size set pieces and rented airplanes dictated by the budget. Most progress toward a movie until 2011 was in miniature. We found the silenced Twister kit from Germany has similar dimensions to the airship's fighter plane. So we built one. Twister ZF-600 made its public debut at Oshkosh Air Venture. What could have happened will make for a hell of an entertaining motion picture, if done right. So we're looking for the best partners to make ZRS into the next box office blockbuster. <music>